Good evening. It is Wednesday, February 17th, and it is time for our midweek Bible study here at Travis Baptist Church. We are glad you've joined us. We realize right now, internet service, electricity, water, all those things seem like luxuries that we so often take for granted. Down here in Corpus Christi, of course, we've had a, as tough a week as everybody else in Texas. We're not used to the cold weather, but we have probably... Uh, a third of our city knocked out of lights and probably water also. We have a boil order. We have low pressure. Um, the streets, thankfully, are clear now. And uh, temperatures today are above freezing. And I got up this morning, went outside about 530, and everything was just wet, not icy. So that is a, a blessing many in our state do not have. Um, so we want to continue being much prayer for what's going on around us. And uh, uh, our grocery stores have been swamped. Um, our gas stations are running out. And uh, so um, it's just one of them weeks. So hopefully hopefully by the time next week rolls around, we got a semblance of normalcy. But we realize while we're coming out of it, the rest of Texas um, is going to be struggling. So... This may last, as far as shortages go, another week or two. Who knows? We are glad you're here with us, though, and hopefully we can find some comfort together in God's Word. Coming up here at Travis Baptist Church, of course, we got worship service this Sunday. Um, it will be at 1045. We'll have uh, Sunday school at 930. We have had lights and water all through this thing, so our, our lights have not gone out yet. Um, tomorrow, Thursday, the 18th, um, we will be having Awana at 615, 620 rather. Um, as far as I know, we're still having it. I haven't heard anything different from the leadership there. And then if they have Awana at 620, then we will have our prayer meeting at 630 in the sanctuary. We started that last week. We hope you can join us this week. We really got something to pray about, don't we? So uh, come and join us for that. We want to be in a, a, a next Monday. This coming Monday is going to be our next vacation Bible school meeting. That will be at 630 in the sanctuary. Come and join us for that. If you are in the Corpus Christi area uh, today, tomorrow, and you're struggling without lights and water, you need a place to come that's at least a little bit warm. Um, we have drinking fountains, but we got a boil order, so you're really not supposed to use them. Uh, but you, we can turn a heat on in a room for you to take a nap at. Um, if you know how to do a hot spot, we can probably give you a spot where uh, if your kids to need, need to get online and, and do some school, um, we can do that in a warm room. And uh, so let us know. Um, uh, come by the church. Our number is 853-9967. You can respond on our Facebook page. You can message us through that. Um, so uh, we'd like to help if we can, okay? Uh, again, let us be in prayer for all that's going on around us. And uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Our Lord and our God, we love you. And we need your mercy. We need your grace. We need you to do something. Father, so many families uh, in this area across our nation struggling right now without heat, without water, um, struggling just to get food. Uh, we are praying at every level, Lord, from the suppliers, the line workers, those who are trying to get the power back on, those who are uh, trying to supply us with basic necessities. We're praying for them, Lord. We're praying for the families that are suffering. We're praying for our schools that kids, again, are, are struggling because not only do they have to go online this week, but the ones without lights, there's not a lot they can do. Lord, we, we need your help. This is way bigger than us. Um, the power companies, the people who manage the grid in this state, Lord, it's, it's beyond them. We need a touch from you somehow, some way. Bring her warmer weather. Bring uh, some kind of miraculous healing to our power systems. God, we're praying here in Corpus Christi. They say there's a, a break in the, the water main, so we're praying that they can find that. And get it repaired quickly. We're praying, Lord, because we don't know what else to do. We, well, this is beyond us. This is beyond government. It's, it's beyond pointing a finger at who's to blame. These are record-setting temperatures. It's never been this cold here. We're, we're, we need you to step in and intervene. Please, Lord. 
And we, we, we pray for those who are ill, those who are in the hospitals, those who are having to take care of someone during these difficult days. Bless them, Lord. Um, help us. Come down. Your Holy Spirit flowing through these cities, through this state, to give people hope, to give people strength. We need this so desperately, and we say all this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. We are... Uh, this coming Sunday, one more announcement. We are going to be beginning a new series of messages. It's going to last from the 21st, this Sunday, through Easter Sunday. Um, kind of like Lent or something. But it's just a, a, a time, kind of like 40 days of prayer, where we all want to be on the same page as a church. That we're going to be having the sermons, and then we're going to have a Bible study that ties into them. Here's the booklet. It is out in the foyer. And uh, the name of the series is called Torn. And the idea of Torn is that we are going to go through the veil that Jesus tore when he died. Uh, going to go through it and find our way to the empty tomb. We're going to be talking a lot about how important it is that because that veil was torn in the temple, uh, what that means as far as access for us, as far as blessing for us. The high price it took, this Sunday we'll be talking about the high price it took to tear that temple, that veil. And... Uh, uh, so you'll want to join us each week. There's about six or eight questions for you to reflect upon to keep driving these messages home, to kind of draw us closer to the Lord. Last year at this time, this virus was just kicking off, and um, uh, we didn't think it'd be this bad, and we certainly didn't think we'd still be messing with it a year later. Um, we missed Easter last year in a sense. We did it online, um, but this year we want to do it together. And so, uh, please join us in our Torn Bible Study. Um, if you're able to be here present, we will have these out in the foyer. If you are not able to be here, we can get you one um, digitally. I can email you a copy of it. And uh, it won't have the pretty red cover, though. Okay? Uh, but uh, if you need one, we would like for you to have it and to join us along. You'll be able to watch those sermons online every week. long as we got lights around here, we can, we can post them. And long as you got a way of getting on the internet, uh, you can hear them and follow along and, and be part of it, okay? All right. We're going to begin our Bible study now. Let me get my Bible. Uh, we have been talking the last several weeks, about two months now, on the idea of death, the last enemy. And uh, so it's just been a series of messages. We started out, uh, there's a book by um, Michael uh, Weisner. On, it's called Death the Last Enemy. And that's also a phrase out of the, uh, the Bible that death is our last enemy. And uh, it's just meditations on what death means. And, and we've been kind of doing that. We've talked about judgment. Um, and we will be talking about judgment probably in the next week or two again. But uh, today um, we want to talk about the topic of heaven. Is that a place on earth? Um, I've heard people say, you know... Um, the song by the Go-Go's, you know, we'll make heaven a place on earth. Um, is that a pipe dream? Is that something actually possible? I'll, we're going to be reading out of Isaiah chapter 35. Isaiah chapter 35. And this is a passage, and man, many, 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 many years ago, I heard a message on this passage that just stuck in my heart with this idea of heaven on earth. We could never recreate what's going to go on in heaven here on earth. We can never make it that good. We've all had moments, a vacation, a special family time, um, being reunited with a loved one, um, maybe just some really good food. And you said, man, I bet this is what God's banquet table is like. You know, um, We could never recreate heaven on earth. But... Isaiah 35, I think, gives us something to shoot for. Um, so we're going to be in Isaiah chapter 35. We're going to be walking through the passage. I'm not going to read it all at once. We'll just walk through it, kind of. And uh, a couple of verses at a time and talk about it briefly, of this idea of heaven on earth. And, and, and here's the point I want to make. Um, when we talk about things like vision and dreams and what I wish it could all be, God kind of reveals to us in His Word what, if I can say it this way, anthropomorphically, um, what does God dream of? What does He wish we could all be? Now, God doesn't really wish because one day we're going to be exactly what He wants us to be. 
But if we can picture God laying in bed at night, what does He wish was going on down here on earth? I think Isaiah 35 is a, a good picture of this. Um, and that God wants to bring this to pass. Um, Isaiah 35, I'm going to look at verse uh, uh, 1 and 2, you know. And, and God starts out in this prophecy with Isaiah, chapter 35, verse 1. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. And then he says, and they shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. I think the first part of being heaven on earth is we want to see the presence of God obviously. By obviously, I mean clear and present. He uses the word picture here in verses 1 and 2 of a desert blooming. You know, you got sand, you got scrub, you got, you know, I live here in South Texas and that drive from San Antonio to Corpus Christi, um, is there an uglier drive in the state of Texas? Get mad at me if you will, but I said it on the internet. Because um, it's a drive of basically flat, maybe a little bit of hills. Every, you know, even the mesquite trees are only about 10 feet tall. Um, everything looks scrubby and ugly. And, um, but in the springtime, when we've had enough rain, there on the medians of that freeway, that ugly little drive turns into so pretty because you get the blue bonnets and the Indian paintbrushes, and all that color comes blooming up in all that scrubby area. This is the picture, man, a barren desert, and now it's blooming. It looks pretty, and instead of just being plain old sand and stuff, and in the midst of all that, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Earth is like that desert. Our lives are like that desert, barren, plain, mundane. Can they see the glory of God in it? Is it possible that somehow, some way, we can reflect God's glorious presence in this common, barren land. A second thing, we move on to verse 3 and 4. So the prophet continues, Strengthen the weak hand. Strength, let me do it again. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. And say to those who are fearful hearted, Be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. And with the recompense of God, He will come and save you. Heaven on earth, those of us who have been beaten down, those of you who feel victimized, those of you who have tried and struggled, look, our vulnerability in heaven and heaven on earth, our vulnerability replaced with confidence. Look at those weak hands of ours. We, we are frail, we're feeble, we're old. Strengthen them. Make firm those feeble knees, man. You know, I, I sit too long, I get up, and my knees just hurt for the first 20 steps. Um, getting knees and hips replaced. And, and, and even then, just because of all the stresses, man, your body's beaten down and weakened. Say to those who are fearful hearted, be strong, don't fear, behold. What's going to happen that changes all this? Your God. Your God will come with vengeance, with payback for all those bad people. He will come and save you. See, our vulnerability, our weakness... God wants to replace with confidence. Confidence that He is coming. Confidence that everything bad we've gone through, He's going to pay back those who've oppressed us. From the devil on down to your boss, you know. Um, think about the fact that heaven on earth includes seeing God's glory at work. Heaven on earth includes seeing God's presence. Heaven on earth includes seeing God strengthening our vulnerability. It is no shame to admit that we can't. His strength the Word of God says, is made perfect in our weakness. Think about that. Turning our vulnerability into confidence. A third condition here of heaven on earth. Verse 5. The eyes of the blind are opened. The ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute shall sing. Waters are going to burst forth in the wilderness, deserts in the stream, in the desert, streams in the desert, what I should have said. Verse 7, the parched ground becomes a pool, thirsty land becomes springs of water. In the habitation of jackals where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. Instead of the dry out Serengeti, uh, barren, 
place. Again, we see restoration, lives being restored. The eyes of the blind in verse 5 are open. The mouth of those who can't speak is, is un, it, 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 are speaking. They're going to sing. The ears of the deaf are unstopped. Waters in the wilderness, all of these. Heaven on earth means lives are being restored. All right? Heaven on earth means lives are being changed and restored. And God is doing great things. Sometimes it's miracles. Sometimes it's just, you know what? I was down the wrong path and God's bringing me on the right path. Let's look at another condition in this passage of heaven on earth. Verse 8. A highway. A highway shall there be in a road. And it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. But it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, listen to this, whoever walks this road, although a fool, shall not go astray. Victory over sin becomes a way of life. See, we're always beaten down by our sin, but here in verse 8 he's talking about, look, out in this wilderness, out in this mess that we live in, there's going to be a road. And that road... Man, I lost my page. That road, um, 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 that road is called the way, the highway of holiness. Not that you and I are perfect, but that God has gotten us walking His road, doing the right thing. The unclean won't pass over it, but it shall be for others. And even though you're a fool, even though you've been making bad decisions in the past, even people like you and me won't go astray. This is wonderful news here. Because part of heaven on earth is victory over our habitual sins. Victory over the bad decisions. Victory over our own foolishness and disobedience that God is bringing about in our lives. We're starting to add these things up. We want to see heaven on earth. Verse 9. Now we're talking about that highway. We're talking about this wilderness we're going through. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there. Not these crazy meat-eating wild animals. You remember how you know it says no lion there. Over in the New Testament, it talks about Satan walking about like a ravenous lion, seeking whom he may devour. What if God got that out of the way? No lions there. No evil beasts, but the redeemed. God's people are going to walk there. The ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. In verse 10, we see some things that we do see in heaven, uh, in the new Jerusalem. The, the idea of walking into Zion singing, and, and everlasting joy, and and all of this sounds wonderful. Is it possible to have it here? Not completely. But what if, as we read a passage like Isaiah 35, 1 through 10, you start to think about your church, our church, your church, the Lord's church, the congregation of believers, not just you out there on your own because you're too holy because churches are hypocritical and they're full of failures and they're people that are not as, you know, whatever. Um, you've been hurt by the church, whatever. But, 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 but look what God is saying. This is what I want my church to be. A little microcosm, a little tiny piece of heaven on earth. Churches are often full of failures, but you know, let's go back and look at these conditions. Wouldn't you love it that our church was a place, like we saw in verses 1 and 2, where God's presence is obvious. Where when we get together, we know the Lord is here. We sing that little chorus. It's an old one to some of y'all. It's still new to old guys like me. Um, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. When you gather together with God's people, does that thought occur to you? Yeah. You know, this last Sunday was frigidly cold outside and our heat really strained to keep it tolerable enough in the sanctuary. And the Sunday before, we had a really good Sunday, a lot of crap. You know, and, and, and we get together as God's people, and everything's going on around us, but suddenly, surely, the presence of the Lord is in this place. That's part of what verses 1 and 2 are talking about, that, that 
maybe we're not perfect and maybe we're not 24-7, but man, when God's people get together, do we sense the presence of the Lord there? Is that our church? Number two in our list. Is our church a place where vulnerability gets replaced with confidence? You know, we read in verses 3 and 4 about strengthening the weak hands and the feeble knees and telling people to be strong, do not fear your God is going to come. Is your church a place where you find that? You find you are encouraged. Your vulnerability, you go in there thinking, man, I am nothing, I'm not, will they even like me? And you leave finding out, God loves me. God is fighting for me. Neither death, nor darkness, nor peril, nor sword, nor nakedness, nor famine, nor all this cold weather, nor the lack of water or heat means that God has abandoned me. Nothing will separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Does your church leave you feeling that way? Lead you to feel that way? To experience that as part of your life? That your vulnerability, your weakness, replaced with the confidence of His strength and His presence? That's what church ought to result in. Heaven on earth ought to be a, the church ought to be a tiny little piece of that. Our third condition, we mentioned lives being restored. The blind seeing, the, the mute singing, the deaf hearing and rejoicing. And in all of this, you know, whether we're experiencing real miracles like that or not, but are we experiencing lives being restored? Are we experiencing, you know, that which is broken being fixed? That which has struggled standing up on its own two feet because God is holding us by the hand. Um, church ought to be like that. A place where when we're wounded and broken, we are finding encouragement, we're finding help, and we're finding hope. And then our fourth condition that we mentioned is, you know, victory over sin is a way of life. Uh, when we read verse um, 8, and we talk about that highway, that highway uh, of holiness that our church helps us get on that road. Our church helps us to stay on that road. We're all tired of hearing about the famous preacher types that had great ministries, but you turn out, man, they were just fallen, sinful people. Some of them, in fact, leaving a, a trail of victims behind. It's a sad thing. Um, we've... We need to get back to our local churches and quit depending on these guys on the internets and the superstars and the Christian celebrities and get back to where, you know what, I know who my pastor is. I know who my Sunday school teacher is. I don't just sit in a big crowd, but I've got a small group I'm a part of where there's accountability. Um, if we want to get on that highway to holiness, church helps us get on there. The fellowship of other Christians encouraging us. Not someone yelling at you to keep all the rules. Not you being embarrassed about what you are. But as we lift each other up and as we go hand in hand down that road. Too many people have a picture of church that may or may not be true, but it is not accurate. Maybe you're, you've been to bad churches. Maybe you've been to those churches where you didn't know anyone and, and you were just a face in a crowd and you're all upset of the hypocrisy you saw. Why don't you get into a church where, hey, somebody saw you here last week and they recognize you at HEB. Yeah, that's the smaller ones. Where there's some accountability. Where there's a, a, you actually do have a place. Church can help us in our lives changing. We're that small corner of heaven that helps us have victory over sin. And then this last point, you know, where our security and joy are uninterrupted. Churches have struggles. Churches have predators. Churches have sin. But in also, a church is also where you're going to find a place of safety and security. The devil is going to attack the church that's obedient. The church that's trying to be all these things. That's trying to, to make God's presence obvious. The church that's trying to replace your vulnerability with confidence. The devil's going to come after us. The church that wants to restore lives. The devil's going to hate us and he's going to raise up stinks and division in. The church that wants to help us have victory over sin as a way of life. Yeah, he's going to be all over us. But when we gather in his name and we are prayed up and we are in the word. You know what? The devil has a lot less power and influence. Those lions that are attacking us, seeking whom they may devour. When we are united around Jesus, we have so much power with us, it's incredible. 
we resist the devil, he will flee. He doesn't have to be a main persecutor in your life. All we're saying with this passage is, yeah, it's impossible to make heaven on earth, but you know what? Maybe our local church, your local church, your Sunday school class, your Bible study group, your Awana club, those little small pockets of Christians you get together, maybe that can be your little corner of heaven. You all aren't perfect, but it's safe. You all are vulnerable. But you got confidence there because united we stand. I love here at Travis Baptist in the middle of our service on Sunday mornings. We have family prayer time. We just stop and pray. The altar is open. You can go up there and pray. You can pray right where you're sitting. Someone will go pray with you. Um, I have heard and I've actually been in a couple services when we were visiting somewhere. Or you were lucky to have maybe an opening and a closing prayer. Um, we have another one we had, you know, where we pray over the offering. We pray about four times in our service at least. Man, prayer ought to be a big part of our services. God's people uniting together. Maybe that's the missing resource of why your church doesn't feel like heaven on earth. Why you have few of those moments. Y'all get together and pray and not just going through God bless our sick and heal. No, but we're praying about holiness. We're praying about getting to know God better. Making himself more real to us. Changing us into what we ought to be. Are we praying about these characteristics that we see in chapter 5? Uh, or in chapter 35 of Isaiah? That we are going to, that, that we're going to see God's glory. We're going to experience restoration and we're going to experience life change and we're going to pray that God has shown himself to us in such a way that gives us ability to overcome all our vulnerability and have confidence in him that's what church ought to be and there are prayers there's two of them in the book of Ephesians by the apostle Paul one in chapter 1 and one in chapter 3 where he basically prays for this not that you'd get healed, not that you'd feel better about yourself, but that you would get to know the Lord better and all the change that that brings in your life. That's a key to heaven on earth. Getting to know Him better. We all want three easy steps to a better marriage, a better career. We want three easy... What we need is getting to know God better, and I think that'll improve our marriages, our walk, our relationships, our jobs, our education... Carrying that attitude with us everywhere we go. They say in heaven love comes first. If we would love one another. If we would love God. With all our heart. Mind. Strength. Spirit. Love our neighbors ourself. You can have that small piece of heaven right here. Right now. Let's pray. We love you, Lord, and we thank you that you love us like you do. Again, we pray, God, so many without heat, so many without resources, so many that are so vulnerable right now in the midst of a pandemic, all this is happening. Supply chain severely hampered by the weather. Lord, please, 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 reach down. Heal us. Help us. Bring warmer weather. Give strength to those who are serving our power grids. Give wisdom to our leaders. Help all those workers who are the first responders of restoring power and water and, and other utilities and, and the, the supplies of grocery stores. God, keep them safe, keep them strong. Help them to endure the extra hours they'll be working. Help their families to understand why mom or dad isn't there. They're helping. And God, help us all to realize there are no mundane jobs out there. Help us to realize life is a precious thing. If we've learned anything in the last 12, 13 months, is we can't take anything for granted anymore. One thing's coming after another. The virus, the riots, the politics, police violence, riots against police, defunding election, whether election was stolen or not. 
now we're the, the, the attack at the Capitol, and now this. Help us, Lord. Whatever your purpose is, we embrace that purpose. But we're praying for help. We're praying for relief. We're praying for you to give us peace in all this. We say it all in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray for one another. Pray for what's going on. Lean on the Lord during all these times. We hope to see you Sunday if you're able to make it. May God bless you. We're going to have our uh, prayer meeting tomorrow night, 6.30. We're going to have Awana tomorrow night, 6.15. Love to see you here. Sunday school, 9.30 on Sunday. Worship at 10.45. And please don't forget to get your torn study Bible study booklet, all right? Thanks a lot. Have a blessed week.